yeah, Japan said deuces to the world for over two centuries. Here's how it went down and why it stopped. Also, fair warning with pronunciation. I'm probably about to butcher more Japanese than the Ram Re Crocodiles. First and foremost, this video was suggested by Mr. Aaron Venata, so credit where credit's due. Sakoku, which means closed country by the way, lasted from 1639 to 1853, and they didn't completely close themselves off. They still traded with China and a few other kingdoms, mostly through the city of Nagasaki, and they allowed the Dutch to have a trading port in that same city. And as far as the Western powers were concerned, Japan was a no-go. See, this guy, Tokugawa Imitsu, was Shogun of Japan, part of the Tokugawa or Edo Shogunate that lasted from 1600 to 1868. Japan's issues with European power stem from an influx of European goods and ideals, mostly Catholicism. Also, he wanted to make sure he kept as much power as possible and, more importantly, limit the power of the daimyos, which were basically feudal lords in charge of parts of the country but were all under the emperor. Think governor, but if one of the governors gained enough military power, he could take over the presidency. That's what we're looking at here. If the Shogun could control the trade, he could control what was brought in. This in addition to Sanken Kotai, meaning alternate attendance, and required the daimyos to alternate between living in their territory and at the main palace allowed him to keep the daimyos power in check. And speaking of power, Tokugawa really did not trust the Europeans, especially the Spanish and Portuguese, but to be fair, a lot of people regretted trusting the Spanish and Portuguese. The Japanese had seen them use their military strength on others and they feared that they'd do the same to them. So how did Japan do during this Edo period? Well, pretty well. Their economic strength increased they focused on culture and art. I have to admit, Japanese Edo period art is some of my favorite art. And then the black ships came. Remember I said black ships, not black fleet. That one waged a pirate war against France. Yeah, we got a video about it. See, during this period, several countries tried to establish relations with Japan, and they pretty much all failed. Portugal tried to force trade, but a Japanese blockade stopped them. Russia tried over and over, but were shot down every time. America tried a few times, and it was after one of these attempts that it was reported to Congress that gunboat diplomacy might just be necessary. As far as what gunboat diplomacy was, well, it was the predecessor to Teddy Roosevelt's famous speak softly and carry a big stick i.e. we'll negotiate, but if things don't go our way, we're ready to fight. It was basically the diplomatic version of, look, this is gonna happen, we can either do this the easy way or the hard way. But why Japan? Well, America did a lot of whaling in Japanese waters, and considering foreigners who were shipwrecked were typically either thrown in prison or executed, this wasn't working for them. Plus, we can't forget about Manifest Destiny, and Japan looked right for the pickings when it came to the spread of Western civilization, and it was a stepping stone to China. And so, in 1852, President Millard Fillmore sent Commodore Matthew Perry, no, not that one, yep, that one, to Japan. Perry sailed over with his four ships, stopped in Edo Harbor, you know, outside the capital, and demanded to speak to officials. And, you know, just in case, he fired blanks from his 73 cannons to make sure they had their attention, as well as sending a letter explaining that they wanted peace, but if the Japanese showed any aggression, the United States would destroy them. At this time, Tokugawa was ill and therefore unavailable, so it was decided by his underlings that meeting with Perry and accepting a letter to the Shogun from a foreign president would be alright. And so that's what happened. On July 14th, 1853, Perry and 250 troops landed to great ceremony. They delivered the letter, stayed for a few days, then left for Hong Kong, telling the Japanese that they would be back for an answer in a year. By the way, they came back six months later, but we'll get to that. In the meantime, time, Tokugawa died a few days after they left. His son, Tokugawa Usada, took over, but he was considered young and sickly. So, the chief senior counselor, Abe Masahiro, dealt with the issue. He pulled the daimyos, but didn't get much of an answer there, so it was decided that since Japan couldn't match the American military might, it was best to just go ahead and give in. Also, in the meantime, other countries had heard about the U.S. negotiating with Japan, and they wanted in on that honeypot. And hearing this, Perry returned early with 10 ships and 1,600 men this time, ready to handle this once and for all. His attitude going in was, this 
this is going to happen whether they like it or not. But rather than a fight, the sides met at Yokohama and signed the convention of Kanagawa, which opened up a few ports for American trade as well as establishing a consulate and terms for how American shipwrecked sailors would be treated. Essentially with this, Sokoku ended more countries signing treaties with Japan not long after. And that, folks, is why Sokoku began and ended. Oh, and if you didn't understand my earlier reference, the Battle of Ramri Island, which is off the coast of Myanmar, occurred between the British and Japanese in World War II. After the battle, the Japanese retreated into the island's saltwater marshes, and according to unverified reports, between 400 and 980 Japanese soldiers were eaten by crocodiles. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records. Oh, and the Guinness Book of World Records? Yep, created by that Guinness to settle pub arguments. 